Hello everyone, welcome to Advancing Adventism. Now in this video, we're going to be looking at an article by an early SDA pioneer named William S. Ingram. Now, why should we care what this guy has to say? Well, um, we have a couple of really good reasons. First, we have evidence to prove that God himself endorsed William Ingram through Ellen White as being someone who should be out teaching the present truth message while he was alive. And second, the topic of his article that we're going to be looking at here has to do with one of our most important pillar SDA doctrines. So clearly we should care about what he has to say. But before getting into the article, I want to briefly share uh, evidence to support what I just said. Okay, so here's Ellen White identifying the personality of God as one of the pillars of our faith. But it's not just a pillar doctrine. She also said about the personality of God that it's everything to us as a people. Okay, now it might be really easy to kind of just breeze past that point. You know, some of us are aware of this statement from Ellen White. Um, and we might just breeze past it without really realizing just how important it is. So let's just take just a moment to consider that, okay? If something is everything to us as a people, surely that's something that Satan's going to try very diligently to distort and completely destroy, if possible, the true teaching on this foundational, you know, pillar doctrine that Ellen White says is everything to us as a people, because it is such a foundational truth. So we should really care deeply about making sure that we rightly understand this all-important pillar doctrine. Okay, now here's another statement from Ellen White um, making another important statement about this topic, the personality of God. Uh, she says we're on the very same foundation. Now, this statement is taken from 1906, so very late in her ministry and, and in her lifetime. She says we are on the same, very same foundation, and we have the same evidence. Okay, so that's really important to know. Also, uh, it's not like you know, over time, the evidence changed and or was no longer valid, right? She's saying that we're on the same foundation and we have the same evidence. Now, here's another statement from Ellen White, and there's a couple of reasons that this is particularly relevant for um, showing that, you know, why we should care about what Ingram had to say about the personality of God. So there's two main points I want you to know from this statement. We'll start with the latter half. So just look down to where you see those three dots, the ellipsis. Uh, she says, when the power of God testifies as to what is truth, that truth is to stand forever as the truth. Uh, then she goes on to say, no after suppositions contrary to the light God has given are to be entertained. Okay, so remember, when God establishes a truth, we shouldn't entertain theories that might arise that would be contrary to that truth. So, it, you know, obviously it's really important that we understand what the truth is in the first place. Otherwise, we wouldn't even be able to recognize if it was contrary or not. Okay, now let's go back to the beginning of the statement. And she says there, I have been pleading with the Lord for strength and wisdom to reproduce the writings of the witnesses who were confirmed in the faith in the early history of the message. Okay, now William Ingram was one of those who were confirmed in the faith in the early history of the message. And there's two pieces of evidence that directly shows this point. First, we have this report from James White. Uh, this is published in the Review and Herald, November 25, 1851. And here she, he's identifying uh, William Ingram as one of the preaching brethren. So clearly he was recognized by the church at large as being someone who understood uh, the pillar doctrines well enough to be out teaching as a preacher. Okay, but even more significantly than that, just 14 days earlier, November 11, 1851, we have a letter from James White to uh, the Brethren in Christ that shows that he was recognized by God as he, being Ingram, was recognized by God as someone who understood the present truth message well enough to be out teaching it. Um, okay, so in this letter, James White is kind of reporting how 
things had gone at some various conferences he and Ellen White had recently attended. And at one of these conferences, William Ingram was there. Now he says, Brother Ingram, a preacher of considerable talent, was present. Now right now I'm reading from the letter itself in that first stretch of yellow highlighted area. Okay, He says, Brother Ingram, a preacher of considerable talent, was present. He is in the truth, has a good spirit. Okay, but then notice what else he says there also in the highlighted section just lower down. And we'll make that bigger so it's easier to see. He tells them about a vision that Ellen White had while Ingram was present at one of these conferences. And in this vision, God showed Ellen White that Ingram was one of the preaching brethren who must feed the sheep. So here we see that God himself showed Ellen that Ingram was confirmed in the faith and that he should be teaching the present truth message. Now, this doesn't mean that everything Ingram ever wrote on every subject was, you know, necessarily correct. Um, having God's endorsement doesn't equate to someone being infallible, you know, but as we saw from that last statement uh, by Ellen White, wherein she was talking about how she wanted to be reproducing the writings of those who had been confirmed in the faith very early on in the message, she pointed to a class of early SDA pioneers and we've just seen that Ingram was a part of that class, those who were confirmed in the faith, okay? And that endorsement was made particularly in the context of discussing um, the pillars of our faith. So when it comes to the pillar doctrines of Seventh-day Adventism, we have several statements from Ellen White and even this vision on record about God endorsing a particular pioneer showing that there are early pioneers who understood these pillar doctrines. Okay, so we're going to be looking at what William Ingram had to say about the personality of God in this article, but just very quickly before we really delve into it, I'll share a couple more little tidbits of information about William Ingram. So he had been an Adventist Prior to 1844, he went through the great disappointment and all that. He had been looking for Jesus to return personally to the earth. Um, and then uh, afterward, he ended up accepting the seventh day Sabbath. And he also accepted that Ellen White had been um, given the gift of prophecy. And so he became a seventh day Adventist and he remained a seventh day Adventist until he died in 1874. Okay. So this article, as you can see on your screen there, this is um, from the Review and Herald, June 25, 1867. And he's explaining um, the truth of the personality of God. Now he starts by quoting Matthew 6, verse 9, Our Father, which art in heaven. Then he says, in making remarks on this text, I do not design to refer to every point, but discuss the following propositions. Number one, God is a personal being. And number two, heaven is a location. Okay, now um, these are the two key points he's going to be addressing in the article. And we will be considering both of them. But in this video, I'm only going to be considering the first proposition. Okay, it's a whole lot to cover and it just would have been too long. But I will be making an additional video covering the next proposition, heaven is a location. And in that other video, I plan to um, include other pioneers besides William Ingram. So it won't just be him. It'll be additional pioneers, including Ellen White. Okay. So he, he starts off with this part in his article, and then he goes on to say, when we consider the orthodox view, so-called, of this subject, we find it left in dark obscurity, forming no foundation for Christian faith or hope. Okay, then notice what he says is the reason why uh, it gives us no foundation for Christian faith or hope. Because God is supposed to be a being without body or parts. Okay, well, you might be wondering, well, what's so wrong about that, right? Okay, well, what he says next explains it. Thus denying virtually his real existence. Okay, so the claim that 
God as a being without body or parts, he says, is equivalent to virtually denying God's actual existence. You know, uh, this is super important. Ingram's point is that if you say God has no body or parts, uh, it's the same as denying that he even exists. Okay. So obviously he regarded uh, existence as necessarily including having a body and parts. Okay. Now, while you might not fully understand how his reasoning is going right now, by the end of this video, you should have a very, very clear understanding of why he's equating these two ideas. Okay. But for now, let's just continue on with the article because at least for now, we can just simply be going through what he says so that we can understand, you know, the evidence that he's laying out and everything that has that he has to say about this pillar doctrine that Ellen White said is everything to us as a people. Okay, so continuing, he says, God is supposed to be a being without body or parts, thus denying virtually his real existence. And if believed in at all, we must confidently endorse the notion that he is immaterial. Okay, now that word immaterial means not material. Okay, when you add the prefix I am to a word, um, it just negates whatever follows it. So, I mean, you can think of just about any word that you can add the I am prefix to. If you add I am to patient, it becomes impatient, which just means not patient, or perfect becomes imperfect, which means not perfect. Okay, so immateriality or immaterial means not material. So all of the attributes, all of the qualities of materiality or matter, think of all the attributes related to matter that you can think of. And then immateriality is not any of that. Okay, so this will be explained more fully as we go but we'll just continue on for now. Okay. He says, uh, if believed in at all, we must confidently endorse the notion that God is immaterial. And if form is in any way connected with him, it must be ghost-like or shadowy. And to doubt the sentiment of poets and call in question their poetic fancy that heaven is beyond the bounds of time and space is an outrageous crime hardly to be forgiven in this world or in the world to come. Okay, now notice what he says next. But, okay, that's a really big word, right? But that word denotes a contrast is about to come. So he's going to contrast something against beyond the bounds of time and space. He says, but there is a pleasure in the thought that God does really exist. All right, so let's consider that for just a moment. He says uh, it's considered by most to be, you know, almost unforgivable to even question the idea of God in heaven being beyond the bounds of time and space. Then he, in, in contrast, he says, but God does really exist. Okay, so here again, we see that Ingram believes the idea of being beyond the bounds of time and space, which is the claim of immateriality. Uh, immateriality is supposed to be beyond the bounds of time and space. That would imply that God doesn't actually exist. Okay. He's putting that in contrast. You know, those two ideas are in contrast. That's really, really important. It shows that he's basically saying that to say God is beyond the bounds of time and space is the same as denying his existence. Uh, so he is of the perspective that beyond the bounds of time and space is equivalent to non-existence. Okay. That there is no existence beyond the bounds of time and space. Um, now he continues and he says, okay, so there's a pleasure in the thought that God does really exist and also that the home of the saints is a city fair made of solid material which will never decay. Okay, now here again, matter occupies space and time. 
Okay. Immateriality is the negation of materiality. So the idea there is that immateriality is supposed to be beyond the bounds of time and space, but Ingram is pointing out that something with no body, no parts, uh, no matter, something that's supposed to be beyond the bounds of time and space is the same as non-existence. Okay. This belief is known as materialism, the belief that all existence is material. And we have other content on this channel that addresses materialism and also addresses immaterialism more fully. So, you know, be sure and check that out and I'll have, you know, links in the description and all that for you guys. Okay. But for now, we'll be moving on. Okay, he says, with these reflections, the reader is called to a consideration of the question in debate. So now he's about to really get into his first proposition. And one, God is a real person. Okay, now why say real person? You know, why not just say God is a person? Well, sometimes SDAs, you know, the early SDAs did sometimes just say God is a person, you know. Um, rather than specifying a real person, but they also very often added that qualification that he is a real person. And they did the same thing uh, when they were writing on the personality of angels. They would often, you know, refer to angels as real beings or real persons, you know, and he even does that sort of thing further on in, uh, in this very article. But um, one of the reasons that seems apparent for why they would specify real person very often in their writings is because pretty much all Christians would admit that God is a person, right? Um, but most Christians aren't going to admit that God is material. Most Christians think that you can be a person and yet you can be immaterial. All early SDAs, however, rejected this notion. Uh, they rejected immateriality altogether. They said there's no such thing as immateriality. It's just another word for non-entity. Okay, so Ingram is um, about to get into the scriptural evidence for his first proposition. So let's pay close attention to what he says here. He says, my first proof in support of this proposition is Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. The point in question is the expression, the image of God. Many suppose this consists in nature and not in form. And as God is said to be immortal and man being in the image of God, the conclusion is that man must be immortal also. If this reasoning is correct, why not embrace other attributes of the divine mind? Is immortality the only attribute he possesses? Is he not omnipresent and omnipotent also? To reason from the nature of God to the nature of man, which no one has any right to do, would exalt man to the throne of the universe and place him on the right hand of the majesty in the heavens. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 shows that man was made in the image of God. And Genesis 2, verse 7 uh, proves that man was formed of the dust of the ground. The conclusion is clear that that which was made or formed of the dust of the ground was made in the image of God. Okay, and of course, you know, the dust of the ground is physical. It's material. It has form. Right? Being made of the dust of the ground gives no implication of immortality uh, or any other attribute of God's nature. Being made of the dust of the ground actually indicates materiality. And Ingram is pointing out that this man made of dust of the ground is what was made in the image of God. Okay, there's nothing non physical being implied here. Okay, so he continues. Paul's testimony corroborates this fact. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 7, For a man indeed ought not to cover his head for as much as he is the image and glory of God. Here, man with a head and not a headless ghost is the image of God. Okay, 
He says, in my old discipline, I used to read that the creator was without body or parts. This I never could believe. The Bible taught me another way. What saith the word? Exodus 33, 18. And he, Moses, said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Verse 20. And he said, now this is God now uh, responding to Moses after Moses asks to see God's glory. Now notice what God says in response. God says, thou canst not see my face. For, okay, so now God's about to give the reason why Moses can't see God's face. For there shall no man see me and live. Okay. Notice God doesn't tell Moses that the reason Moses can't see God's face is because God doesn't have a face uh, or because God's immaterial and, you know, immateriality can't be seen. He doesn't say that's the reason. The reason why Moses can't see God's face is because no man can see God's face and live. Now, uh, at least not in our present sinful condition, right? Another relevant point for this passage is that the Hebrew word that's translated glory would actually be better translated substance. Okay, but anyway, uh, then Ingram quotes verses 21 and 23. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in a cleft of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand, okay, while I pass by, and I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, okay, but my face shall not be seen. Okay, now before moving on, let's consider what we just read. Uh, in this passage from Exodus 33 that Ingram is quoting, keep in mind Moses asks to see God's glory or God's substance, and God doesn't respond by saying it's impossible to see anything related to him because he doesn't have any substance or he doesn't, you know, he doesn't have uh, a, a body at all or he's immaterial, you know. Uh, he starts to explain to Moses just how he's going to go about things so that Moses can see parts of his body. And in so doing, God says he has a hand, he says he has back parts, and he tells Moses that he has a face. He just, you know, won't be able to see his face. Okay. Now, clearly, the word glory here isn't being used to refer to anything immaterial. Sure, yeah, Moses isn't going to be allowed to see uh, God's face. But again, the reason isn't because he doesn't have a face or because he's immaterial. It's because in our present sinful condition, anyway, we can't see God and live. Okay, so we'd better just keep moving on here. Uh, Ingram says, I am aware that doctors of divinity live in this age, and certainly this age is the place for them. Had they lived in the age of Moses, they would have been out of employment, for this great truth was not sick at that time, not having as yet fallen into the hands of uninspired physicians. In other words, back in the days of Moses, uh, people knew that God was physical, uh, you know, had a, a physical body. He was a being that was physical with parts, uh, which is presumably, you know, why Moses asked to see God's substance. Okay, then Ingram says in Exodus 24, verses 9, 10, and 11, a scene of majesty and grandeur is witnessed by Moses and the elders of Israel. Then he quotes it, Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and seventy of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel. Okay, so here's another testimony that God can be seen. There's substance there to see if we're permitted to do so. Then the passage continues, And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also, they saw God and did eat and drink. Okay, next Ingram says, some tell us that the Bible does not prove the existence of God, but takes it for granted. 
With lawyers, evidence is that which demonstrates and makes plain. Have we such evidence of the existence of God? In the above record, it is plainly stated that God was seen by more than 70 witnesses. Is all this taken for granted? Okay, now keep in mind that this is all in support of his first proposition, right? And that is that God is a personal being or God is a real person. He goes on to say, verse 10, and this is still in Exodus 24, and they saw the God of Israel. Okay, so as part of his supporting evidence, for the fact that God is a real person rather than an immaterial ghost-like shadowy something. He's pointing to scriptures that plainly state that people have seen parts of God's body. Okay. Now notice what Ingram says next. The view that many entertain in relation to the immateriality of God, we admit is taken for granted for the proof is lacking. And, you know, that's still the case today. Uh, By and large, people who think God is immaterial didn't arrive at this conclusion based off of a personal investigation of the scriptures to see what they say on the topic. Uh, They just take it for granted that God's immaterial because that's what most people think or, you know, that's what they were taught or they heard it in church or wherever. Um, But when you go to the scriptures and you just see what they have to say about God, you don't find anywhere in the scriptures that says God is bodiless or immaterial in any way. Uh, There's nothing like that at all. Okay, so now Ingram goes on to say, one text more from the Old Testament and then we will come to the new. Daniel 7 verse 9. I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. None dare deny but that a person is here described, but say that Christ is meant. How does this better the case? Trinitarians tell us that Christ is the eternal God, and if this be true, when Daniel speaks of the Ancient of Days, he means Christ, and when he sees Christ, he sees the eternal God, for both are one. Again, if the view that Trinitarians hold be true that Christ is the Almighty God and that Daniel in verses 9 and 10 refers to Christ, My point is gained, that is, that God is a person. Okay, now before we continue reading there, um, I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Okay, now even though Ingram rejected the doctrine of the Trinity, the point of his statement here isn't an argument against Trinitarianism. Okay, instead, he's responding to an objection that some Trinitarians put forward to the early SDA view of Daniel 7, okay? And he's saying that even if their interpretation is correct, that Christ is the Almighty God, the Ancient of Days, you know, this still wouldn't disprove his point. It wouldn't be an argument against Ingram's main contention, that is, that God has a body, okay? Now, Remember, I mean, Daniel describes seeing the Ancient of Days as a corporeal being, as a bodily being, not as an immaterial or bodiless, ghost-like, shadowy something, right? So no matter what, Ingram's point is gained. That's what he's saying here. So with that said, we'll just pick up reading again there at the bottom. He says, but I deny that Daniel in verses 9 and 10 refers to Christ at all. The prophet in this record not only represents the majesty and glory of the divine being, but represents him as presiding in judgment. In verse 13, he says, I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. So 
they brought the son of day uh, the the son of man near before the ancient of days okay then ingram says if the ancient of days is jesus christ who is the son of man that stands before him in verse 14 the son of man receives a kingdom from the father or the ancient of days query does christ stand before himself does he receive a kingdom from himself how rational the conclusion that the father and the son are both seen in this vision and that they are separate persons so he's just saying here that the rational conclusion from all this is that these verses in daniel portray two separate persons two separate beings uh, the father and the son then he goes on to say this idea does not harmonize with the notion that at the incarnation of christ two whole and perfect natures the father and son or human and divine were joined together never to be separated but says one this vision was given long before the birth of christ then ingram adds but sir this does not help your case in the least for the eye of the prophet penetrated the future and he was carried in heavenly vision down the stream of time to where the thrones shall crumble before the majesty of heaven as he sits in judgment to fix the destiny of men and place his son on david's throne to reign some testimony from the new testament will be offered acts 7 verse 56 and he's saying here um stephen stephen said behold i see the heavens opened and the son of man standing on the right hand of god then ingram says testimony of dying men is usually considered good evidence especially if they have their reason we cannot question the soundness of stephen and then what he says next is going to explain why he says that we can't question the soundness of stephen the 55th verse says but he stephen being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. In other words, we can't question the soundness of Stephen's dying testimony because he was inspired by the Holy Ghost to see this, you know, to see Jesus standing on God's right hand. Okay, so then Ingram says, query, did Stephen see Christ? Most certainly what was his position it was standing where did he stand on the right hand of god how do we know whether he stood on god's right hand or on his left by giving heed to the declaration of this man of truth he says he saw god and his son this evidence proves conclusively that god is a person Okay, now we'll just stop there just for a moment to consider a few things. Okay, keep in mind, again, this whole section is dealing with the first proposition that God is a real person. And what has Ingram been citing as his evidence for that? Not that God has character traits. Not that God is conscious. Instead, he's been focusing on the fact that God is a material being with a physical form he has a body and parts and he supports this fact by scripture testimony of people having seen god's bodily existence god's body right clearly to ingram personhood is fundamentally about being a being with a body and parts now we have a series of videos going through the early SDA use of the word person and its variants, you know, words like personal, impersonal, personality, personage, that sort of thing. In that series, we go through very, uh, in very great detail, how they used these words. And it all shows that this wasn't just Ingram's unique perspective on this topic of personhood. Okay, it was fundamental to this SDA pillar doctrine of the personality of God and all early SDAs uh, prior to the time when Kellogg started publicly teaching the idea that God isn't 
tied to a physical form or a physical location, but is actually personally everywhere present. Prior to that, all early SDAs taught harmoniously that a person is a being, a material being with a body and parts occupying space and time. Now, um, I'll be sure and have a link to those videos as well on the end screen and in the description. So for now, we should keep going with the article. Okay, he says, uh, we will now listen to Paul. Philippians 2 verses 5 and 6. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Then notice what Ingram asks. How can Christ be in the form of God if God has no form? It's a good question. He goes on to say, does this mean that the humanity was equal to the divinity and that the humanity was in form like the divinity? Turn this passage as you will, and it proves that God has a form. Now, what he's saying there is this. Okay, Paul says Christ was in the form of God, and people who object to the idea that God is a physical being with a physical form sometimes say that this passage uh, isn't referring to the pre-incarnate Christ, uh, just to saying that Christ as a human was in the form of God because humans are made in the image of God, right? And Ingram's like, well, regardless of when you would say that Christ was in the form of God, it still proves that God has a form. So anyway, okay, he continues and he quotes from Hebrews 1, 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his, the father's person, this is evidence that cannot be denied unless the doubting mind has some selfish end in view. A vast amount of evidence might be added to the above. Who was that majestic being that spake on the burning mount in the midst of thunders and darkness, only broken by the lightning's flash and the glory of him that spake? It was one whose voice shook the earth and made the Israelitish host to tremble. Now notice what he says next. Was this the voice of an immaterial ghost? And then he says, no, God was there. Moses says he saw him. Now, keep in mind that immateriality, being the negation of all materiality, couldn't even have the possibility of being seen. He then quotes Deuteronomy 9, verse 10, And the Lord delivered unto me two tables of stone written with the finger of God. How could a non-entity deliver to a man tables of stone? How could an immaterial being plow the solid rock with its finger and deeply embed or write a law on stone? Here again, immateriality is the negation of materiality. It has no means of interacting with matter. An immaterial being, if such a thing could exist, could have no way of interacting with stone to write anything on it. Um, but obviously Ingram is saying that an immaterial being is a non-entity. It doesn't exist. That's a very important point that I really hope that everyone is catching, right? And, and paying close attention to and keeping in mind. Okay, moving on. He quotes Matthew 17, 5, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Peter says this voice came from heaven, 2 Peter 1, 18. Moses was on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was permitted to hear the same voice that spake the Ten Commandments when he was on Mount Sinai, and at that time he saw the one that spake. Matthew 18, 10, Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. There are two points worthy of remark in this text. Number one, the Father was in heaven and the Son on earth. 
Surely the divinity was separated once from the humanity. Now that parenthetical note, he adds, that's him referring back to earlier when uh, he posed an objection that someone might raise. And he was like, hey, no matter how you might turn this passage, it still proves my point that God is a person. Um, anyway, if you want to check that out, you can go back a few slides and see that. Okay. So again, the first thing he says that's worthy of remark in this text is the fact that the father was in heaven and the son was on earth. Okay. In other words, they weren't in the same location. They weren't occupying the same space. And the second point is God is said to have a face, right? And now notice what he says next. So God is said to have a face, which proves his personality. Now, nowadays, when people use the word personality, it's really common to use it to refer to character traits. Okay. Um, that's what most people usually mean when they say someone's personality. But in this context of the SDA pillar doctrine of the personality of God, the word personality here is being used to refer to personhood in general. Okay. As in, um, is God a person and what does it mean for God to be a person? Okay. Now, again, when In Ingram says God has a face, which proves his personality, it's pretty clear that he means it's the physical bodily existence of God that proves he's a real person. Okay, moving on. Quotes Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This cannot refer to Christ, for every eye shall see him. Revelation 1, 7. And then he quotes Matthew 24, 30. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He says, all the nations of the earth will see the Son of Man, but only the pure in heart will be permitted to see the Father. And then he quotes, and they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads. Okay, now he doesn't give the reference for that, but that's taken from uh, Revelation 22, 4. Okay, then he goes on to say, enough has been said on this part of the subject and we now submit it to the judgment of the reader. If we have proved our first point, the second is easily reached. If God is a personal being, he must have a fixed habitation. Okay, now let's consider that for just a moment. He says, if God is a personal being, he must have a fixed habitation. This is very different from how most Christians would argue, right? Most Christians would readily admit that God is a personal being, but they certainly wouldn't admit that it means he must have a fixed habitation. So what can we learn from this? Okay, well, one thing is that early SDAs had a radically different view of personhood as compared to other Christians. Most Christians think it's possible to be a person without a body and thus without a definite location. Early SDAs, on the other hand, believed Personhood necessitates physicality. Being a person requires being a body. And thus, of course, being a person would imply having a definite location. Now, from this point, he starts to get into his second proposition. So we're going to save that for another video. But just take note of everything that he's done in this first section everything that he's done to prove that God is a real person. He's explaining our pillar doctrine of the personality of God. And in so doing, he's equating an immaterial being with a non-entity. He says that if you say God is beyond the bounds of time and space, that you virtually deny his very existence, right? There is no existence beyond the bounds of space and time, according to Ingram. And remember what we saw earlier at the beginning of this presentation from Ellen White. She said that 
the evidence for the personality of God hadn't changed over time and neither had the doctrine. She said, we're on the same foundation. We have the same evidence in regard to the personality of God, the personality of Christ and all these subjects. Okay. She also said that, uh, she wanted to be reproducing the writings of the early pioneers who were confirmed in the message and that no after suppositions contrary to the light God had already given should be entertained. And then we also saw that God himself endorsed Ingram through Ellen White as being someone who must feed the sheep. Obviously, God believed that Ingram was knowledgeable enough about our doctrines that he could feed the sheep. Now, what all this shows is that we should take William Ingram's article very much to heart, and we should make sure that we rightly understand uh, the truth of this doctrine that Ellen White says is everything to us as a people, because the majority of SDAs today believe that God is in some way immaterial, either in part or in whole. Now, here are two additional places where you can go to learn more on this topic, and we always have extra links in the description as well. I hope that you will be able to really delve into it deep and make sure that you're understanding this pillar doctrine rightly. Um, now, if you like this video and you can see how important it is, please share it with someone that you love. And as always, we hope that you were very blessed.